I'm going to start the program and I will let the other people um, come in as um, time goes by. So welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for coming to today's program. My name is Miriam Anderson. I am the board member of the World Affairs Council of Tacoma and also the um, treasurer of the World Affairs Council of Tacoma. Uh, today we have a very special event um, program to cover and we have a very special guest um, uh, who's going to speak about the women's and girls' rights in Afghanistan. First of all, I would like to acknowledge um, the partnership uh, World Affairs Council of Tacoma developed with the State Department. And our contact person over there is Irina Garmanova. She has been a key person for us to make sure we get um, the best speakers, the best programs. And I, on behalf of the entire board, I really want to thank you so much, Irina, for your wonderful help and flexibility and patience with us and for making the programs available like today. So I'm going to give you a few words to say about the State Department, the programs, and any other things you would like to um, say to us. Go ahead. Sure, thank you so much. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here with you all this evening and uh, have a great speaker for you on a really important topic. Um, my name is Irina Karmanova. I work with the Office of Public Liaison at the Department of State. So our mission is to um, connect uh, with audiences such as yourselves and make programs like this possible um, all across the country on a variety of foreign policy topics. Um, we engage with high schools, universities, World Affairs Councils, uh, Global Ties Chapters, Sister Cities Chapters, Rotary Clubs, Kiwanis Clubs, uh, business organizations, diaspora um, groups, you name it. <laughs> um, you know, we actively um, do proactive outreach to, um, to engage and try to find um, ways to have meaningful conversations to, to develop a relationship and um, to, to see um, where there's um, possibility for good conversations. Um, just today, we had an event with um, several business organizations and women's empowerment groups um, on a few State Department initiatives. We had a panel discussion on that with some really robust Q&A. Um, we also had an event with the Northern California World Affairs Council earlier today um, with the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of um, our East Asia Pacific uh, Bureau, um, where we discussed um, the President, uh, President Biden's uh, current policy towards China and East Asia and the Pacific region. Um, so we absolutely love programming events like this. So it's a great honor that we're here. Um, and so before I turn it over to our wonderful speaker, I'm just gonna play a quick video, um, a basic introduction to the State Department that kind of sets the tone a little bit. Um, you know, we're such a large organization and our mission is so vast in, in serving the American public um, that it's kind of hard to wrap uh, your mind around it all at once, but it's a, it's a great little one minute video. So I'll go ahead and play that before turning it over. It's a wonderful and complex world out there filled with challenges and opportunities. That's why America's diplomats with the U.S. Department of State are on the job every day representing you. We are advancing America's foreign policy interests by uniting our allies, confronting our adversaries, and protecting our citizens. We advance democracy human rights, global health, and more. We grow markets that create American jobs. We are America's first federal agency, and we're in 190 countries at over 270 U.S. embassies and consulates serving you. We are the United States Department of State. Well, there you have it. Um, and I'll turn it over to Jaspreet. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, with that, Irina, thank you so much again. So with that, I would like to introduce our guest speaker today, Jaspreet Anjil, and she is the foreign officer uh, in the Office of Afghanistan Affairs. She covers the subjects like the United Nations, women's rights, um, justice, um, rule of law, and so on. So today, uh, the focus of our conversation is going to be around women's and girls' rights in Afghanistan. 
So without any further ado, I want to give the floor to um, Jasper Jill and um, she's going to have about up to like a, a seven o'clock, uh, about 20 minutes for her to cover the subject she would like to discuss with us. And after that, I will open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, for your questions, you're welcome to post the question in the chat room. And then after that, I will ask you to um, kind of open your video and I'll and post the question, okay? Without any further ado, uh, so I'd like to introduce you to Jasper. Go ahead, sweetie, and um, take the floor. Thank you so much, Marion. I, I think I was say, um, saying this to, to others before we started, but I am so happy to be uh, speaking with you all. So uh, thrilled to kind of bring foreign policy home. I, I uh, grew up in North and the, uh, just up the I-5 corridor in Snohomish County and, and you know, went to college in the Northwest. And so um, it's been nice to, to kind of come home and, and explain what I do during the day to, to my family and friends in the Northwest. And, and it's great to have you all interested in this topic. I uh, don't have a PowerPoint, so I wanted to make it kind of a more of a discussion. I, I was joking, uh, hopefully we can keep Hans uh, awake since it's late in Florida. <laughs> um, and so I'll, I, um, Miriam mentioned that I cover women's rights and justice and rule of law issues, but I also um, cover our engagement with the UN. I cover refugee and humanitarian issues and have been working on Afghanistan for about five years on and off. So I'm happy to talk about any other kind of topic. Um, so I want to start kind of at a high level in terms of our policy and our interests, so basically what the State, the State Department is focused on, um, and then kind of go from there in terms of the state of play, uh, what we read about in the news, and hopefully give you uh, some insights beyond what you read about in the news or hear about in the news. Um, so I think most people know that when we went to September or when we went to uh, Afghanistan in September 2001, we were really focused on um, terrorism and, and Al Qaeda and the aftermath of kind of 9-11. Uh, so that has obviously stayed kind of part of our um, role in Afghanistan has always been kind of guided by this this um, uh, terrorist threat and, and our counterterrorism interests. And so that continues to be one of our major um, kind of interests in Afghanistan. But beyond that, um, we've also been working for oh, since 2001 and, and, and continue to work kind of for broader stability. And so that's where I think you get um, a lot of our work in terms of promoting human rights, for promoting a, a, an inclusive government, for economic development, just all of the, the things that we have been doing in Afghanistan um, and then are trying to find ways to continue to do. Um, obviously, you all know what happened last summer in, in August um, when the Taliban took over Kabul. Um, and, and so I'm happy to kind of talk about how we got there, but also just talk about what's happened since then. Um, so what I maybe I'll give you a little update on what's happened since then. Um, so we've really been guided by uh, supporting the Afghan people. Uh, and so what you see is that since August of last year, we have provided over uh, $700 million in humanitarian assistance. And that's only based on humanitarian need. You know, it comes with no other strings attached other than we see lots of suffering and, and the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. It's, it's been, it's been a humanitarian crisis of, of different, um, severity levels for the last couple of years. So that wasn't new, um, but they've had a longstanding um, drought that, that, uh, you know, that was almost unprecedented. And then um, this economic crisis that made the humanitarian situation so much worse and that even if people had money, they couldn't buy food, they couldn't get cash to buy food. Um, so there's uh, just unprecedented, I guess, levels of food insecurity um, and just, other lots of kind of things that come with humanitarian crises in terms of just desperation, lots of negative coping mechanisms. So we've uh, primarily been working with UN agencies and humanitarian organizations on providing humanitarian assistance. Um, we also kind of recognize that to help the Afghan people, you know, we'll have to engage with the Taliban. So I mentioned some of our interests at the top. Um, so all the things in terms of human rights, inclusive government, counterterrorism, you know, uh, economic stability. We, we also had this huge operation of relocating Afghans. We 
we engage with the Afghan uh, with the Taliban on all of those efforts. Um, so from October through March, we we sent kind of interagency delegations to meet with Taliban leaders um, in different parts uh, in in Doha, in 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 Oslo, Norway, and and other places. Um, but then after the the March twenty third decision that they made to uh, to bar girls from going to school uh, beyond the sixth grade, we we've really kind of paused and, and are kind of recalibrating our engagement. Um, because one of the things you might have also heard about in the news or seen is that um, you know, people are really worried about the, the economic and the humanitarian situation. And a lot of it is uh, kind of blamed on sanctions. Um, so you know, the US has actually been very forward leaning in issuing um, what is called general licenses, bas basically authorizations so that people can deliver humanitarian assistance or help Afghans without kind of running afoul of UN or US sanctions. So we've had seven, seven general licenses. We had a UN Security Council resolution in, in December. Um, and again, the very generous humanitarian assistance just from the US, but also 2.4 billion that was pledged from all, all donors. So the, the UN had a conference on March 31st, and that was a kind of the, the major, uh, that was the total figure. So counting the US, the EU, um, UK, Germany, all the kind of the major donors that you all uh, might be familiar with. Um, so all that to say our, our engagement with the Taliban, we had to pause because we were so, we were, we were actually forward leaning and trying to address the impact of sanctions, trying to address some of the economic crises, some of the, the liquidity issues in terms of getting access to cash. Um, so that has kind of been um, paused slash like is kind of subject to review in terms of uh, we don't want to punish the Afghan people, but we also don't want to help the Taliban when they're not even doing basic things like letting girls go to school. Um, and then just last weekend, they issued a decree um, in with uh, kind of mandating that women have to wear the full head to toe uh, covering and, and that also that they shouldn't leave their their homes unless it's absolutely necessary that they have to have a male guardian. Um, so now you're seeing a bunch of uh, statements or you might have seen a bunch of statements from the US, the UN, because some, some of our kind of like minded allies just kind of expressing our concern. Um, and it's not just in terms of women's dress that we're concerned about is just that all of these kinds of measures over the last couple of months, they've made it even that much harder for women to do basic things like go to school or work or access healthcare. Um, and so that their rights that they had worked to gain uh, you know, over the last two decades are just kind of being eroded very dramatically. And, and so we're working all, all with anyone basically and, and everyone. So the, I already mentioned the UN, I already mentioned kind of our like-minded partners, the countries that, you know, that we work very closely with on um, kind of regional international issues uh, around the world, but also even countries that uh, in the region. So um, Qatar, uh, you know, the, some of the, the neighbors, Central Asian countries, Pakistan. Um, so even Russia and China as part of the Security Council, but also um, as, the, as part of this grouping called the, the expanded Troika, you know, the way we um, meet with them and, and see that we actually have shared interests and that they also want there to be an inclusive government. They want stability in Afghanistan. They don't want these issues spilling over. They also have interests in terms of counterterrorism and 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 the flow of drugs and arms and 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 people um, kind of destabilizing the, the region. Um, the last thing I'll um, kind of say in terms of our U.S. policy at the top is sometimes there's questions about um, recognition, and I just want to clarify that the the U.S. isn't focused on on recognizing the Taliban or, or like as any part of, as the government. And so that's why I, I mentioned that we're really focused on supporting the people of Afghanistan. And, and one of the things I'll mention in, in the context of all of this is that um, over the last 20 years, you know, we we provided a lot of support. We and other donors provided a lot of support to the Afghan government um, in the form of development assistance. You know, so I mentioned that humanitarian assistance is based on need. Our development assistance 
was actually did have political conditions attached to it. Um, so that you know there was a kind of a mutual accountability framework that we called it with other donors, um, where you know the government agreed to you know, do certain things. They, they had to meet certain benchmarks for the aid to flow. Um, and so all of that stopped um, in August. And, and so even the U, US programs, we paused and reviewed, okay, which ones can we continue? Which ones are no longer, um, you know, no longer meet the conditions? And then ones that were not flowing through the government that you know, were, where you're working with civil society or media or kind of independent um, local or national organizations, um, just trying to see how we can continue those. And so I mentioned that because I think sometimes uh, in, in the press, when you read about it, it talks about how all this donor um, assistance has stopped flowing. Um, but you might, I, I think that the, the part about the conditions um, is, is um, not always in the narrative. Um, and we were always clear with the, with the Taliban and other donors were too, going back to like 2018, 2019, we were very clear that if you, um, you know, tried to have a violent takeover, that you will lose all this international support that if you want international support and legitimacy there are certain things that you have to do and and, and all of those still kind of ring true in terms of that they need domestic legitimacy first um that they, they need to respect human rights um and again the that they need to take um steps to address um uh, terrorist threats so that Afghanistan is no is not a threat to us or our allies or a, really any country um so I, I think those kinds of um things still remain true. Uh, but one of the challenges obviously is when you see this uh, humanitarian crisis with some of the worst like famine levels in the world, it's just how can you, we continue to kind of um, help people and, and to sustain some of those institutions that are supposed to serve the people like the government ministries um, or even the health, health um, sector. Uh, so what, what has happened in the last couple of months is the UN and, and some other organizations have really stepped up to start providing those supports. So the International Committee of the Red Cross is actually um, kind of propping up all of the public hospitals in the country and, and the kind of the healthcare system and, and uh, organizations like UNICEF are trying to do the same for the education sector so that public schools continue to run. Um, so I think that uh, hopefully was is a kind of a good scene setter for in terms of some of the the high level things that like or the context and things that like and how we see the world. Um, and happy to take questions after I, I kind of go through where we are with women's rights. So I've already mentioned the the educate access to education. Obviously, um, it's one of the things that I think in the international community it's it's a kind of a basic universal human right. It's not threatened. Um, like it is in Afghanistan and other places like it is in Afghanistan. Um, so I think from the donor perspective for us, this was, this is something that is so easy or should be so easy for the Taliban to do, to build confidence, to, to get, um, not just with the international community, but with other Afghans that, you know, they've changed from the nineties, that they're uh, going to be different. And, and so that, that's why I think the, the decision in, in March was so disappointing um, for everyone is because they had been giving both private and public assurances that schools were going to open. And, and so I, I, we all probably saw in the news that the girls were literally turned away um, from their schools. Like, you know, they'd gotten up, like gone to school. Um, and it was really a whole, a shock to the whole country. Um, there were supposed to be ceremonies that everyone had been preparing for this day. Um, they were really caught off guard because the decision came at the 11th hour. Um, so not everyone heard until, you know, they had already arrived at school, like, oh, you have to go back home. Um, they're not allowing girls to attend beyond uh, the sixth grade. So what's happening now is that public schools, girls are only allowed to attend up to the sixth grade, except in a couple of provinces. It's about eight or nine provinces where they've stayed open just because of people demanding it, that they, they the, just the local demands. And, and so the provincial and kind of district, the, the Taliban authorities in those provinces have kind of have to be responsive to their constituents. Um, the other um, strange thing about this uh, education ban is that public universities continue to be open to, to women. Um, they're uh, segregated by gender and then, and they Girl, uh, women uh, aren't able to take all the classes, but they're still able to go and uh, like access university level education. And then for private schools, uh, there are no restrictions really, and that they're able to continue. Um, I, I don't think there are any co-ed 
um, facilities, the, the American University of Afghanistan, which the US government has supported since it um, opened, was one of the, the few that was a, a co-ed um, and that they've kind of moved to a, a model where they're um, teaching online and, and across the region. Um, the other kind of indicators for, for women's rights that I'll flag for you all very quickly, uh, I guess it's no surprise to anyone that there are no women in the government anymore. Um, so before the Taliban takeover, women were about a third of civil servants. Um, they had positions in leadership, you know, serving as ambassadors or as cabinet ministers. There weren't a lot of them. Um, some of them were kind of in token positions, but still they were members of parliament. There's a quota. So they were, um, you know, they were a third of, uh, had a third of parliamentary seats. And so women were much more visible before um, than they are now. Um, so they're, the, the Taliban, that's one of the things that um, you know, the international community has really pushed on is maybe in, you know, in local institutions that it, where the women had been leading maybe as deputy governors or other positions to, to involve them in, in, in political processes. But I think it'll be a long road so, since obviously the Taliban haven't taken kind of any meaningful steps to towards an inclusive government of, of any kind for forget gender diversity. Um, the other kind of big, I guess, um, indicator sometimes is like the violence against women or gender based violence. So Afghanistan was already one of the worst places in the world um, in, for to be a woman um, in terms of these issues. And so now the Taliban has really kind of cracked down on, on some of the shelters, some of the, the institutions that kind of provided support to women. Um, one of the things that the international community worked on um, since the 2000s was the uh, providing kind of support, building up these institutions so women could access justice so they could escape domestic violence and do all of those things. And so all of those kind of shelters and other things have pretty much gone underground or, or shut down. Um, and they're trying to figure out, again, how do you, how do you support support women who um, need to you know, escape violent family members and all of that. So um, I think they're trying, the, the partners that we talked to, they're trying to kind of come up with like a family guidance center model um, where there, it, it could be more acceptable to the Taliban um, that, you know, women are, you know, staying overnight in a women's shelter, but they're and they have family mediation or they have other kind of services. Um, but in, in terms of like formal justice or any kind of support, um, there it's it's very tough right now. And then the, the major one that I'll flag just in terms of practical things is women's economic participation has gone down um, just dramatically. Um, so we, since we are so focused on humanitarian assistance. We've insisted from day one that women be allowed um, to work as humanitarian aid workers and also that they be prioritized as kind of as beneficiaries of humanitarian aid. Um, so we've made progress there, but it's uneven just because of the, the variances in, in different provinces. Um, and, but in other sectors, women were essentially told to go home. Some of them have continued to work uh, kind of as healthcare workers or as teachers, or again, in sectors where they're um, necessary, they're needed or they have certain technical expertise, but it's very rare. Um, I'm coming up on seven o'clock and I've talked a lot, um, but I will just flag in terms of other human rights priorities, the situation in Afghanistan was never great. Um, and so now I, I, we, you know, we still have all of the same issues that we were focused on before, um, but we, we see more attacks on kind of ethnic and re religious minorities. So uh, just the last couple of weeks, there have been the during Ramadan, there were attacks on mosques, um, some of which were claimed by the ISIS affiliate in the region. So they were targeting the Shia uh, minority um, and some Sufi mosques. Um, media freedom is a huge issue. Um, Afghanistan, um, believe it or not, was one of the kind of the most like free media environments um, in the region compared to, again, some of the Central Asian, Central and South Asian countries. Um, so they had a very vibrant um, and free media. Uh, but now the, the, with Taliban um, you know, kind of really cracking down, uh, they've uh, been detaining journalists. Um, they want to kind of um, censor and, and, and even ads and all this stuff. So we see a lot of organizations um, shutting down and it's very hard to get information from um, the country because people aren't speaking up about some of the things that they're seeing, um, which leads me to kind of this issue of 
uh, what we call reprisal killings. Um, so in August, the Taliban announced an amnesty that they would not target um, uh, the kind of their former enemies you know, who worked in the Afghan government or in the security forces. Um, but the Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, all these organizations and the UN, they have documented uh, what we call reprisal killings around the country. Um, and so it's our sense that they're probably underreported because people aren't able to report widely and openly about um, some of the uh, kind of the targeted attacks that might be happening. Um, all right, so I have talked a lot. <laughs> um, I'm happy to kind of circle back or just uh, just take any of general questions you all have um, about Afghanistan or what we're doing to support women and, and to kind of promote human rights um, or, or or anything else. <laughs> yes, but thank you so much. I uh, very much appreciate it. So I will ask the first question and either you can post the question or you can just raise the hand and I will call your name. So. My first question for you will be um, following. So you said that United States will um, give certain permits um, to deliver aids or um, do any kind of businesses. Is there a certain quota from United States side and also from the Afghanistan side? And who makes that decision, um, like a Taliban regime or um, anybody else who decides, you know, what has to arrive to the country and why and whether all this aid arriving to Afghanistan goes to the um, designated location. Yeah, so in terms of the licenses, there's no quota and they've actually over time they've become much more expansive. It's probably one of the, the most expansive, the most recent one that was issued in February is the most expense, expansive that the Treasury Department has issued. So they're authorizing pretty much any commercial activity, whereas earlier last year we had started with very narrow focused on just humanitarian needs to certain sectors. Um, and then over time we've realized that you know we there are other things that might not count as humanitarian, like purely humanitarian, but we need it to kind of meet basic human needs. Um, so that's kind of something with the, like the livelihoods where um, people, um, the, the economy is so bad and they, the, you know, there's a global food security crisis now with the crisis, with, with uh, everything happening in Ukraine um, that, that we've had to kind of expand. So in terms of your question about what to bring into the country or what activities to do. Um, so the, the humanitarian work, um, there are principles that are kind of internationally recognized that the, the UN kind of oversees and they coordinate all the humanitarian assistance in the country. And so it's supposed to, again, be delivered based on need. Um, it's not supposed to have any kind of political interference. Um, so we would try to really stick to those. Um, the Taliban initially welcomed the humanitarian assistance. They, like I mentioned, they let women work as humanitarian aid workers, um, all of that. But the last couple of months, maybe probably starting in January or so, we saw them starting to interfere more and more. It was a very harsh winter in Afghanistan. And so they tried to kind of say, they tried to direct where the aid was going, which communities it was benefiting. And so the World Food Program is probably the most um, I guess, well-known example where they've had to pause some of their deliveries um, because there was interference by the local authorities. But usually what they're able to do is, is kind of negotiate and say, look, we, we're going to have to pause or you know, these are the principles that, that we need or these are the conditions that we need. One of the big ones I forgot to mention is just kind of unhindered humanitarian access. So again, based on need, they need to be able to access the communities. Um, so that's why the, the Taliban trying to direct aid to certain com uh, communities or kind of their rural constituents is, is a deal breaker and, and it, it doesn't work in terms of the assessed needs of the UN or, or whichever organi humanitarian organization is bringing it in. Okay, so does that much. answer your question? Yeah, good, yeah. yeah. So, okay, uh, Hans uh, goes and then Marsha. Um, I have two questions, so, but uh, the first one is, why do you think the, um, now, why did, why did the Taliban do this now? Uh, was it, I mean, did somebody uh, have a political uh, or a religious uh, revelation or all of a sudden, is it a method of control? Um, are they 
playing to a constituency that's a hardline constituency in this Mexico. What's your, what's your feel for that? Why now? So you're referring to the kind of the, the, cra the crackdown or restrictions on, on women and girls, right? Specifically? Correct. Yes. Okay. So uh, there are a lot of great uh, Taliban analysts. It was not one of the, the um, things that I sought out to become. I didn't, did not want to become a Taliban expert, um, <laughs> but I guess you kind of have to become a Taliban expert. So um, one of the things that we see, and it, it's again, when people do a postmortem of what went wrong in the last you know, couple of years, but also last 20 years, um, the, the Taliban was always a hardline kind of conservative movement. Um, but they obviously engaged in a peace process with, with the U.S., with other Afghans. And so what you see, I think, happening now is that, it, and they were always cohesive. So we, we, the U.S., kind of tested their internal cohesion a couple of times when we were talking to them. Um, you know, they had certain ceasefires or other things where they really kind of um, you know, held it together as an organization to show that, you know, they, they can follow orders uh, all the way down to the kind of their foot soldiers. Um, so it's always been a very, I guess, assessed to be a cohesive, disciplined organization. But what you see happening now, I think, are the tensions between the, the moderates, the ones that want to engage with the international community, that want all of the assistance, that just want to kind of live in peace, you know, with other Afghans and the, the conservative um, kind of hardliners. So that the leader uh, of the organization, uh, Haibatullah uh, Akunzada, you know, he hasn't really, he's been in public a couple of times in, in, that, in, in Kandahar, the Southern kind of conservative province. And when the decision about girls' school came, schools came out, there were all these things in the press that, you know, he doesn't want to see girls going to school in, in Kandahar. Um, so it was kind of one of the examples of where these um, few conservative hardliners kind of won out. Um, so now some of the people who've been analyzing the decision have been saying that, oh, maybe since they're so slow to make decisions as an organization, they work by consensus. Oh, that maybe if you know they weren't kind of backed into this corner with March 23rd as schools reopening, having if they had kind of had some other way to consult internally, that maybe they would have made a different decision. Um, but the 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 most recent kind of the May 7th, the, the decree on, on women's dress and, and movement. Um, again, there, there has been different interpretations of why they're doing that. Some people think that in order to reopen schools for girls, that they have to uh, make some concessions to the conservatives and the hardliners. Um, so this is kind of the price you have to pay that, and that, that, that in the next couple of weeks, we'll see some religious scholars make a decision that, oh, girls are able to go to school. It's not against Islam and it's, it's totally fine, um, but they have to be fully covered or they have to like, again, meet all these conditions um, so that some people think it's going in that direction. Uh, but I, I, I think most people do see it as kind of this internal tension in the movement that they're really being tested um, in ways that we haven't seen before um, in, in, in how they're the, between the people who want to engage with the international community and the people who just really are choosing to isolate themselves, you know, the ones in, in, in the deep south who, who don't care about any of the incentives that the international community is offering them and, and don't want to see girls back in school. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll let somebody else ask a question and save my well, Masha, second. you go up to that. Uh, um, unmute yourself, Masha. Unmute, unmute, unmute yourself. Thank Two you. Two years into this and I'm still forgetting the frigging mute button. Mother <laughs> God, she is slow. Um, Jess Preach, you, you referenced the tension between that's inherent in the situation where the US government wants to provide humanitarian aid and do what they can to support Afghans who are starving, um, but not want to see any of that, those monies end up supporting the Taliban government. H how can that be resolved? How can we be sure that money goes where we want it to go and doesn't get co-opted? So we have been working very hard <laughs> kind of on that 
issue. Um, luckily, I guess, unfortunately, we have models from other parts of the world. So in, in Yemen or Syria or a kind of other context where we don't um, want to support government institutions, but we do uh, provide support or are active. Um, so the, the UN especially has, and the World Bank or some of the other kind of international organizations, they, they work in those contexts. And so they have what they call, you know, their risk management um, kind of techniques. Um, but just in terms of a concrete example, I, I mentioned that the International Committee of the Red Cross, um, ICRC, they're um, kind of propping up all the public hospitals. So normally, you know, the Ministry of Public Health in, in Afghanistan, they would get money from the World Bank or the USAID or, or all these other kind of um, donors, and they would pay the salaries for healthcare workers. But what's happening now is that the International Committee of the Red Cross is directly paying salaries um, and, and you know, procuring supplies and doing all the operational costs to keep the hospitals running. So they've kind of um, cut the, any kind of Taliban leaders or ministry out of it. Um, and, and same with, I, I mentioned UNICEF and, and public sector education. Um, the EU provided 50 million euro um, kind of as a humanitarian gesture, um, but also as an incentive to keep teachers um, employed because they hadn't been paid in months. Um, to So they were paying incentives for teachers from January through March, um, and they those were going directly to the teachers. So all the ones that had bank accounts, it's kind of like direct deposit or the, some of the cash apps. It was, hundred dollars a month, um, but they have all these different layers of kind of vetting and verification. So they went and went to the schools and 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 double check to make sure all the teachers, you know, that they were reviewed. They have a solid list. And then once the first payment went out, to just make sure that everyone who was supposed to receive it received it, and so they can just do a full accounting of all the money. Um, the other kind of thing that we do is we have third party monitors. Um, so even our a lot of our humanitarian assistance going through UN agencies. So I, I mentioned um, the World Food Program, um, UNHCR, uh, just all the whole alphabet soup uh, of agencies that are um, operational. And, and so they also have to have very strict kind of risk management um, uh, criteria. I also mentioned we passed a UN Security Council resolution in December. So as a part of that, and as a part of kind of the other kind of Security Council uh, oversight, they have to report to us, the, the Security Council members, on um, any diversion and the diversion if, if the money doesn't go where it's supposed to go, and then any kind of interference. So the reason we know about kind of all these Taliban attempts to direct aid or to interfere in, in, in humanitarian operations is because they have to report it to us and, and resolve it in order to continue. Um, so it's difficult, and, and I think one of the things that's becoming apparent to people is that you en end up uh, setting up almost a parallel system where the UN or all these organizations are, are providing services that the government should like provide, all these public services like education and healthcare. Um, and I think that's why it's the hardest in terms of the economic situation. Um, the banking sector in Afghanistan is completely collapsed. And um, it's hard to kind of substitute for central banks or even you know private uh, uh, all of the things that banks are supposed to do, um, and, and so that's why I think it was so hard for the uh, for the international community to, to make that decision in March to say, okay, we we care about economic stabilization, we want to help solve the banking crisis and, and the crisis in terms of people not being able to withdraw cash, um, you know, you know, printing currency, all of these things, but then we can't do it if the Taliban um, don't take certain steps. Um, so I, I mentioned the conditions. One other condition is that they have to have um, kind of an independent and technocratic central bank leadership. Um, so I think that the Taliban understand that, but they're not there yet. They, they don't have totally, they don't have independent and technocratic leaders who are running their, their central bank. Are there any viable aid organizations on the ground in Afghanistan anymore? Oh, yeah. So I, I mentioned the- That are Afghani based? So yeah, in terms of Afghan um, organizations with the international community always, or was, we have this model of partnering with kind of local partners. Um, so that, that, that still exists. 
Um, it's much harder for the Afghan organizations to operate in this environment, though, um, because I mentioned the banking sector, it impacts them much more than some of the international organizations. They normally don't have um, bank accounts, you know, offshore or like somewhere else in, in, in outside of Afghanistan. Um, so they, a, a lot of them have come to us saying that they can't pay their staff salaries or it's so dangerous for them to do their work that sometimes they're targeted for their work. So they've had a lot of staff leave or, or just quit their jobs. So um, what um, our partners are reporting to us is that they've lost a lot of capacity, a lot of national capacity of Afghan organizations, um, just because it's so hard for them to function um, first because of the economic issues and then all of just kind of the fear, uncertainty, kind of the, the Taliban restrictions. Um, so there, that's been a huge um, loss, I think, for, for everyone. Thank you. Okay, John, go ahead. Yeah, so this is kind of related to Marsha's last question. I was just wondering, kind of in civil society more broadly, um, what's been the fate of things like women's groups and any sort of human, I mean, I assume it must be a really difficult environment. Are they just all gone or are some of them still able to operate? And is this something that the State Department is able to support in any way? Yeah, so they're... Um... A lot of organizations have shut down, but um, we are still supporting um, some of the same partners. So they're still operational. What what they've told us um, is that a lot of them have focused to, uh, or they've shifted focus um, to, to deal with the humanitarian situation because that's where the international funding is. Um, so some of the activities they might have been doing before, they don't have donor support. Um, you know, if they were, for example, working with the government for access to justice or even some of the women's shelters I mentioned, they've shut down, but they're either kind of refocusing their activities, like I mentioned, to become like family guidance centers or or to do um, the, what the, like more humanitarian things where they're um, giving out food or, or, or basic health services. So they're kind of refocusing um, or rebranding themselves, but they're uh, a lot of the same organizations that have been around for a long time are still there. Um, some of them have their kind of leadership, they're, they're kind of they're in exile or outside of the country, but, but most of them are still functioning. One of the things that um, I think um, we knew inherently but didn't realize, um, and, and the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconciliation actually issued a great report called um, Lessons Learned, and one of the things that they flagged was that a lot of these civil society organizations that um, you know, really propped up and, and were super active, they wouldn't be sustainable without donor support. Um, and so I, 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 that's the other kind of reality is um, they're going to international donors to say you have to keep these women's organizations afloat. Um, and I think everyone recognizes that. And so even at the State Department, some of the human rights programming, some of the other programming that we might have done um, you know, with an international organization, now we're thinking, OK, what local organizations or partners can we find just as a way to sustain them and, and to keep that kind of um, network of people on the ground? Um, question comes from Mike, um, but he's asking how large is the Taliban government? So I don't have a, a, a figure in terms of um, a clear number because um, obviously they, they range from different levels of government. So they have um, essentially appointed um, interim um, ministers for all the, the government ministries that existed. So, uh, you know, the finance ministry, all the, the, um, the commerce, like kind of the government department. The Afghan government previously was pretty big. You'd, you'd be surprised by all the different um, departments and organizations they had. So the, the Taliban, I guess, are um, they, they appointed their own people. So they in, in Ministry of Interior, Defense, all of that. Um, in terms of their ranks for fighters, I don't have a figure, but they did um, some of the technical ministries. They kept um, the the bureaucrats, I guess. They kept some of the, the technocrats uh, on board. So not everyone who is a government employee in Afghanistan is a member of the Taliban. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to get a good handle on that. And then um, we do have sanctions. Uh, U.S. sanctions are for the Taliban as an organization and the Haqqani network, but the U.N., they don't um, sanction the Taliban as an organization, so they have about um, 135 people that they list. So there's a difference between everyone who's sanctioned or is a member of the Taliban. 
So it can be a little confusing. I'm sorry, Mike, question. I don't have a clear number for you. <laughs> I will ask one question and after that Hans um, is raising the hand. So then you can ask uh, Hans. Question for you, um, when uh, doing any kind of business, anything, do you have kind of person or organization or any humanitarian, do you need to then negotiate with one person in Taliban that might have very extreme point of view or um, there are other people who might have a little bit more civil understanding of meaning of help and kind of dear help and rights and anything like that. So just one person who's a, a key decision maker or there are more than just one. So I'll try not to be too long winded, um, but basically uh, there's a variety of kind of Taliban um, leaders or, or interlocutors that um, not just the US, but the like other international um, kind of analysts, but also um, partners um, engage with. So for the State Department example, I mentioned that we had kind of formal interagency delegations that met with them. Um, we met with the acting foreign minister um, and, and then he would bring a delegation again based on the topic. So he brought his education ministers, he brought the, the banking people, also the people in charge of humanitarian assistance. Um, but then obviously there's other kind of influential me members and this happens kind of in any government or in every, any kind of organization, whereas um, for example, the Minister of Interior, or the kind of the Taliban so-called Minister of Interior, um, uh, Siraj Haqqani, is seen as kind of this ascendant, like influential figure. So he's been, he just this week, he was meeting with the EU special envoy to talk about girls' education. Um, so then, you know, people kind of find out who are the influencers, even if, you know, they, it's not their primary responsibility to look after girls' education. How can you kind of help influence the decision? the decisions and and who do you engage with um unfortunately the the hardliners they're they're not interested in engaging with the international community so you know we we don't meet with them and we don't know um very many internationals who do um so i think the ones that are most um kind of conversant or um, most accessible are the ones who were either part of the Taliban political commission that was based in Doha. So they were the ones that were doing some of the peace talks with other Afghans, but also other internationals. Um, and then now they've, they've taken kind of positions in, in government. Um, and same with the, there's a, um, the deputy prime ministers and prime ministers. So based on kind of their ideological leanings and 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 some of their beliefs, some of them are again more um, more um, active in engaging with the international community, and they were seen as like moderates. And then that's kind of how the the divisions break down too. But also in terms of humanitarian assistance, usually people talk to whoever either the local authorities in, in that province at the district level, um, or if you know they if something rises to the national level, then they go to the the people at the national level. And so same with like economic issues, same health issues, so they go to like the, the health minister or the, the, the person who's in charge of um, commerce and, and all of that. Okay, um, Hans, go ahead, ask the question. Uh, yeah, um, first, thank you for, uh, for uh, being here this evening and it, it's very interesting and sharing your thoughts. Uh, speaking of influencers, uh, the role of China. And uh, I mean, they stepped up right away are they only really interested in mining the rare earth uh, materials and, and that's it? Or can they be expected to play some additional role? Yeah, so I, I think the, the economic part of it and their interest in like investing um, is obviously the, the one that's most visible. Um, the other things that we hear China say, again, they, they convened a meeting um, March 31st of kind of all the neighboring countries, they as the foreign minister level, so Wang Yi and, and invited um, Lavrov, invited the Pakistani foreign minister, Iranian foreign minister, all the kind of the neighbors of Afghanistan. They hosted a meeting um, and they issued a joint statement, and it did 
cover, again, a range of issues that um, they're all worried about. And so China um, in, in, in the UN and in, in all of these public settings, they, they talk about terrorism. So they are worried about especially um, the Uyghur militants who can go to Afghanistan. Um, and, and they talk about um, kind of political stability, um, but they, they do it again in kind of their way where they don't want to be seen visibly kind of interfering in a country's um, internal affairs. Um, they really criticize the US and, and the West for what they call the unilateral uh, uh, coercive actions for, for sanctions. Um, so they're very anti um, US sanctions against the Taliban. We haven't seen them be outspoken in terms of human rights. Um, in terms of any kind of assistance to Afghanistan, they've provided um, some like vaccines, some kind of medicines, humanitarian assistance, but nothing that you know would be com commensurate with the size of their economy or, or you know, that it could make a meaningful impact. And, and so I think Afghans and, and and we all realize that they're they're not going to fill the gap of the traditional donors. Um, and so, I, I, and the, again, the Taliban have gone to, to China for meetings and, and they also, I think, recognize that while they can have um, some investment, some friendly relations or some kind of legitimacy maybe with China that they're not going to get everything that they are after. Because again, if you think about what the Taliban want, they want to, to be uh, a legitimate actor and they want sanctions rele uh, relief and, and all of that. So they, again, China can't do that um, unilaterally. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, like, like if we look at in countries that have like an, an Islam, like a like a Kuwait, Turkey, um, where um, girls' rights are much more open, much more civilized. Um, do this country can have any kind of influence? on the governance of Taliban and their regime and their point of view uh, when it comes down to women and girls' human rights. Yeah, that, no, that's one of our um, priorities. I'm sorry I didn't mention it earlier, um, but you know it's very clear that we and our friends, our like-minded partners, can't be the only ones who care about human rights or Afghan women. Um, and I think the, the, like the Muslim majority countries realize that. Um, so Qatar has played this outsized role um, during the peace process. They hosted the talks between the US and the Taliban. They also hosted the talks between kind of the Afghan parties. Um, and so they um, have been involved in, in trying to kind of help um, you know, promote these issues. Um, obviously, they're, they're, they're also hosting a huge population of Afghans, so they've been involved with relocation efforts, um, but they um, still maintain an embassy in Kabul. Um, some of the other kind of Muslim majority countries that have been involved are, have been Indonesia. Um, during the peace process, they were one of the countries um, that um, wanted to, ho that hosted the Taliban. They've tried to have kind of a conferences of, of moderate religious scholars. Um, my bosses, they've, they've, you know, also traveled to the Middle East, they've gone to Saudi Arabia, um, United Arab Emirates, um, Secretary Blinken actually appointed a special envoy for um, Afghan women, girls, and human rights issues, and that's one of her priorities is that, um, is to kind of really engage the Muslim world, and, and so, um, you know, we've, we've been working very closely with them. Um, I think that one of the challenges is that, um, the Taliban's Islamic arguments don't really hold up. And that's something that the even the uh, Afghans who were participating and who were negotiating with them in the peace process realized is that, okay, you try to make a religious argument and that that you know it's not all just based in religion. Some of it is just based in kind of in kind of rural Pashtun traditions, some of the things that they're trying to do. Um, and especially on the with the girls' education, um, a lot of influential um, uh, religious scholars have have kind of issued one. There was an open letter from uh, a Pakistani cleric who, again, is is influential with Taliban, um, who kind of decried their their barring girls from going to school. And so, um, hopefully, I think those kinds of voices will have more of an impact um, than than those of us, you know, in, sitting in the West. Okay. Uh, Marcia, you had a question. Yeah, how much of a threat to Taliban rule is a resurgent ISIS? 
you keep reading about ISIS attacks um, sporadically, episodically around the country. And is that, are those just random pot, pot shots or is that, or is that a real deal that, that the Taliban needs to be worried about? That's a really good question. And I forgot to mention it when Hans asked about the why now, because um, one of the other things I think where we see the cohesion of the Taliban being tested is that um, you know they're worried about some of their kind of disaffected fighters um, going to I joining ISIS. Um, and, and so in terms of the threat, the Taliban will say they've contained the threat, um, that it's um, all fine, all under control. But then in terms of the data and the things we're seeing, so we saw the kind of the uh, attacks during Ramadan, um, which looking at the sheer numbers are not um, on that bad compared to the previous levels of violence. So there was a, a ISIS attack at a girl's school last year that killed over 90 people. They attacked a maternity um, clinic, a, a hospital where, you know, the new newborns and like infant ward. And so there have been very like horrific ISIS um, violence in Afghanistan in the past. So I guess in that kind of historical kind of pattern, um, they haven't mounted those kinds of high profile attacks. But then what you see now is that even in Pakistan or some of the, the neighboring countries, there's just a brush up on the border with Tajikistan. So they're seeing more ISIS activity. Um, and, and so I, I, it's something that we all have to, I think, watch very carefully um, in, in, in terms of that. And then we obviously, we, there aren't too many parallels with, with Iraq that I'd want to draw, but that's one of the things that, you know, we're, we have to um, is, uh, watch in terms of the security vacuum. Thank you for that. Um, and then look at what kind of hope we can see, you know, this is, it's such a, a long history of segregation, um, struggle, survival, it just where's the hope, where we can find that little thread of hope, especially for women and girls? Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> um, so I think um, one of the things that I look to is this younger generation of Afghans. Um, right. I, I even the the moderates within the Taliban or others, you know, they've now Afghanistan in the 90s, um, if you looked at it, it wasn't very connected to the world. It didn't have um, a, even electricity. That was one of our major one of the major U.S. Um, projects investments was this all this infrastructure. Um, but again, connecting um, Afghans to the world, giving them helping them access education, all these things. So now I think that it's the demands of the Afghan people, um, right? That they want all of these things for themselves. They want to be able to freely express themselves, um, not just in the social media or media, but just even in terms of their clothing. Um, they want to be, you know, celebrate their diversity with all the different ethnic groups that they of their country and their their cultural traditions. Um, so that's where I think it's that even some members of the Taliban recognize that you know, they're they failed in the 90s um, and that some of the lessons that they have to learn um, in terms of how they govern. Um, but I guess that's where I'm deriving my hope is that um, in terms of the demographics, so much of the country, uh, you know, they were born in the last 20 years. It, I, I, blanking on the statistic now, but they're under the age of 25. Um, and so, you know, they, they don't want to go back to the 90s. They don't want to go back to kind of the living under the Taliban rule that their parents or their other family members did. And, and so they're, they're demanding all of these rights themselves. Uh, and so, you know, we're doing our best to support them and really put that as, as like, how do we support the people and what, what their kind of demands are? So it's not just what we want for them. But it's kind of um, we're close to the um, program. Thank you for staying um, beyond uh, seven thirty. I appreciate just but question another one. Um, like sometimes I'm sure, like everybody else, I feel kind of hopeless. I, I just my pain, my heart just breaks from the pain just watching what has been going on with Afghanistan, and I sometimes fear that all oh, this country is going to get wiped out from the map, like Syria and Yemen, and unfortunately what we can do, how we can participate, what things we can do, people sitting like me at home, you know, with all this luxury stuff around me, what can I do? How yes, can I contribute inter 
the development of human rights for women and girls in Afghanistan? I think so we um, we have a lot of strong advocates, but in terms of if you like so continue to obviously advocate, but um, um, I, I think the most powerful thing that we see again are the work of the the organizations that are still there on the ground, you know that that have negotiated their way um, so they can do all of the great the great work. So again, the the kind of the UN humanitarian organizations, um, so the, uh, people are able to uh, donate directly to them, um, but not even some of the UN ones. There are other other ones like the Red Cross or the International like Medical Corps. So whatever issue I um, that you're passionate about, uh, you know, they, I, uh, I'm positive that there are still functioning like a UN women is still on the ground with their staff trying to do whatever they can um, to support women. I, I think the one challenging thing that people were trying to do, they were trying to fly their own kind of supplies, like collecting like blankets and books and stuff. And I logistically, that's very difficult. Um, you know, even in, in countries like Ukraine, it's a, like, I know I've heard stories of people trying to like fly their own stuff. Um, so I wouldn't do that, but I, um, I can assure you that there's lots of um, kind of scrutiny in terms of how the aid money is spent. And so usually donations to the humanitarian organizations and some of um, those organizations who are still working on the ground um, um, are, are making a difference. And, and one positive thing as, as dire as the humanitarian situation is, the UN did release a report, their um, analysis on food security um, that they actually, um, they're, um, they averted the kind of the worst case scenario last winter and their projections are actually trending positive uh, because of the, the harvest, but also uh, because of some of the, the, the things that people were, that were able to get them through the harsh winter. Um, so I guess our goal now is to avoid the scenario next winter where you know, people are, are, are starving and, and facing just desperate um, circumstances. Okay, Hans has one more questions and then we will close. Thank you. And I promise this is the last one. Um, back in 2001, when the US went into Afghanistan, entered from the north with the assistance of the Northern Alliance, is there still a Northern Alliance that is different than the Pashtun South? So um, you might have heard about the National Resistance Front. Um, so that includes some of the, the, the uh, figures who were part of the Northern Alliance, but not all of them. So it's not the same. Um, uh, it, it's a, a, some of the Tajik kind of power brokers. Um, so they, uh, especially it's, it's again, hard. There's a lot of misinformation out there, but they are um, fighting um, in different parts of the country. Um, but in terms of the kind of the US policy and our stance, we we don't support any armed opposition um, to the Taliban and, and we've been kind of ad, uh, like publicly and privately advocating for, for reconciliation as challenging as it is. You know, it's a, it's a country that's been at war. There's been a civil war conflict since the seventies, you know, over 40 years. And, and so um, we just don't see any one group um, really um, getting to any kind of peaceful resolution um, through uh, armed conflict. And so we, we've been pushing for, for dialogue. Um, I guess the one um, thing I'll say that some of the, the Taliban watchers and analysts say is that if the Taliban don't change, they think that there will be more armed opposition. Um, but in terms of even just some, of, some other uh, like proxies or regional supports, we don't really see a lot of countries in the region, you know, getting behind one group or, or like the new version of the Northern Alliance yet. Um, and I, 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 um, I forget if it was you or someone else who asked about China, but I, but, you know, even the, the China and Russia and others, I think they're, they're, they're um, moving much faster in terms of their relationship with the Taliban, I think with kind of the assumption or, or the implicit um, view that they're, they're not really being challenged. Um, in, in terms of any opposition right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other question we have? If not, oh, thank you so much, um, Jasper. It's, uh, you know, I have too many questions to ask, but you know, I will respect everybody's time and 
time restrictions. So, and hopefully we can um, have you back again, um, talking on other subjects um, with respect to Afghanistan and any other country you specialized as well. So Irina, thank you again so much, uh, very much. Uh, thank you everyone thank for you. coming. It's a dinner time for everybody. Please enjoy your time with your family and um, keep in touch. So I would like to ask Marsha and uh, John to stay with me after you know, we close the program. And thank, thank you, Jessica. That was terrific. That thank you, Jessica. Really this was thank really you. helpful. Thank you so much. I appreciate, yes. appreciate so much. Um, thank well, you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you all for tuning in. I really enjoyed it. Okay. <laughs> Bye, Jessica. Bye, Irina. Bye, Hans. Enjoy your help in Florida, Hans. Thank Glad you. to see you, my friend. Long thank time. You.